Welcome to video 2 for week 11. In the previous video, I defined the notion of a maximum or a minimum for a scalar field, and we talked about how to find them by setting the gradient equal to zero. Now we want to talk about how to classify them. Let me start again by doing a review of what happens with single variable calculus. If I have a single variable function, I find the critical points by setting the derivative equal to zero, and one way I can understand them is by looking at the second derivative. If the second derivative is positive, then I have a function which is concave up and I get a minimum. If the second derivative is negative, I have a function which is concave down and I get a maximum. In this way, the second derivative can be used to classify the behavior of the critical point. If the second derivative is equal to zero, this test is inconclusive and we have to look for some other information to try and figure out what's going on, but this is a pretty good way to understand things. For single variable functions, the second derivative is just one thing. It's a simple thing. For multivariable functions, it's quite a complicated thing. We have many possible second derivatives, pure second partials and mixed second partials. We can put these into a thing which is called a Hessian matrix. So this is a matrix that contains all of the partial, second partial derivatives of a scalar field. Note this is different from the Jacobian matrix, which I defined in week 10. This is always necessarily a square matrix, um, and it will always be symmetric because of Clairaut's theorem. Be this derivative and this derivative are different only in the order in which I take the partial derivatives. So as long as I have a, a function which is twice continuously differentiable, Clairaut's theorem says that, these, says that these will be the same. So what I get is I get square symmetric matrices that gather up all of the second derivatives. For a scalar field with three variables, I get a three by three matrix, and for a scalar field of four variables, I would get a four by four matrix, so forth and so on. For the two variable situation, the behavior is determined by the determinant, pun not intended, of this matrix. So the determinant here is this times this, so those two is here, minus this times this. Clairaut's theorem says that these are the same thing. I will assume that my functions are twice differentiable so that Clairaut's theorem applies. So I can just write this as the mixed partial squared. This thing, which is called D, is going to determine what kind of max or min or saddle point or other behavior I have at the extrema of my function. How does it do that? Well, let me start with a scalar field in R2 and a critical point AB. If this number D is positive, then I either get a max or a min. To figure out what I get a max or a min, this part looks very much like the single variable situation. Here I'm going to look at the mixed or the pure partial in X and see if that thing is positive. If that thing is positive, it's the same kind of concavity that gives me a minimum. If this thing is negative, again, the same kind of concavity as in the single variable situation gives me a maximum. If, however, this number D is less than zero, then I get the saddle point, this pass where it's a maximum in one direction and a minimum in another direction. And finally, if this thing is zero, the test is inconclusive. But this is a pretty good system. I have to calculate this weird combination of the second partial derivatives, but I can figure out if it's positive or it's negative. I might have to check another second partial and, and make a reasonable conclusion about what's going on. It's nice, it's clear, it's algorithmic. That was for a two variable function. I'm going to state the situation for a function of more than two variables. This is not something I necessarily expect all of you to be familiar with. Not all of you have taken linear algebra. Not all of you have studied the eigenvalues of matrices. But this is another really great example for those of you who have, have done linear algebra to see how eigenvalues control so much of the behavior of a matrix. So say I have a function in an Rn and I have a critical point. This H is the Hessian matrix, so it's the n by n matrix of all the partial derivatives. You may remember from linear algebra, those of you who have taken it, that a symmetric matrix will always have the maximum number of eigenvalues. The Hessian matrix is symmetric, assuming that this is a C2 function, so it has the maximum number of eigenvalues. So I can talk about all n eigenvalues counted with multiplicity. If all of them are positive, then I get a local minimum. If all of them are negative, then I get a local maximum. The determinant in the n equals 2 case, in fact, captures this information. Uh, there's a theorem that the determinant is equal to the product of all the eigenvalues. So this actually is equivalent to what I had on the previous slide if you do the relationship between determinants and eigenvalues.
So if they're all positive, I get a minimum. If they're all negative, I get a maximum. This also relates to that notion of concavity. Positive is somehow concave up. Concave up is somehow giving me a minimum. Negative is somehow concave down, giving me a maximum. If I get a mix of positive and negative eigenvalues, then I get some kind of thing like a saddle point. The directions where I have positive eigenvalues, I will have a minimum. The directions where I have negative eigenvalues, I will have a maximum. And I get a whole mixture of these things to give me a point that is a minimum in some directions and a maximum in some directions. And this gives me the notion of a higher dimensional analog of a saddle point. For a function of five variables, I could have two directions where it's a minimum and three directions where it's a maximum, which is sort of a, a multi-dimensional version of a saddle point. Let me do some examples to show you how this works and how it sometimes doesn't work. So here's a function. Here are the partial derivatives. Here's the gradient, set it equal to zero. This gradient is equal to zero if and only if the y coordinate is equal to zero. If you set the y coordinate to zero, you'll find that the, uh, the x coordinate doesn't matter. And if you do anything else, you'll find that it's necessary to have the y coordinate equal to zero. So this is critical on this entire line, so the entire x-axis in this case is a line of critical points. I calculate the partial derivatives, I calculate this number d, and I evaluate d at all of the points on this line, all of these critical points. In this case, it's inconclusive. And you'll find this is often the case when I have a line of critical points. This test d is going to work well for individual isolated critical points, but is typically going to be inconclusive when I have a whole bunch of critical points that are along a line. So what is the behavior here? Well, here's the function. Um, here's that x-axis. I have critical points all along this axis, and you see these are all, in fact, minimum. The function goes up in this direction, the function goes up in this direction, and the function is flat in the direction of the x-axis. And since a minimum uses less than equals as opposed to a strict inequality, these are, are actually local minima of a function. So they are still minima even though the test was inconclusive. The test doesn't need to produce the minimum criteria for us to have a minimum. When the test is inconclusive, all sorts of behaviors can happen. Let me do another example. Here's a quadratic example. Here are the partial derivatives. I set the partial derivatives equal to zero. Um, this is pretty straightforward. x has to be a certain number, y has to be a certain number, so I have exactly one critical point. I calculate the second partial derivatives. I put them into the expression that I have for d, which is this times this, which is 8, minus this squared, which is 0, so 8 minus 0. This is positive, and the partial in x is also positive. That's going to give me a local minimum. If I look at the graph of this function, I do in fact exactly get that local minimum located above y equals 2 and x equals negative 1. Let me do one more example. So here's a degree 4 polynomial, a little more complicated. Um, I've calculated its partial derivatives, set its gradient equal to 0, so both of these need to be 0. I've got x equals 0 or x equals 2. I've got y equals 0 or y equals 3. Any combination works, so I get four critical points um, when x is either 0 or 2, and when y is either 0 or 3. So let me see if I can determine the behavior at all four of those critical points. So here are my four critical points. I calculate the mixed and pure second partial derivatives. Um, my expression d is the pure partial derivatives multiplied together, so this times this. Put that all together, you get 48xy, 4 minus 3x, 2 minus y, and it's going to be minus this squared, well 0 squared is just 0, so I get this expression for d, and then I want to evaluate that expression for d on the four critical points that I'm considering. Now the first three, this is going to give me 0. If, I, if either x or y is 0, this term is going to be 0, and it doesn't matter what these things are, because I'm just going to be multiplying by 0. So for three points, this test is entirely inconclusive. However, for two, three, I don't get zero here. I get that d is positive. And also, if I checked the mix or the pure partial in x at two, three, I would get that that would be negative. This tells me that in the x direction, I have something that is concave down, so I expect a maximum. So I have three inconclusive points and one maximum. What does the graph look like? Well, here's my maximum. I have a very nice... Uh, place there, everything's concave down around it, I get the maximum over x equals 2, y equals 3, exactly as I expected. 
But what about those other three points? Well, they're here, here, and here. And you can see that they do, in fact, have flat tangent planes at all those points. The gradients at all those points are zero. The local tangent plane and all the tangent directions are momentarily flat. But they're neither maxima, minima, nor any kind of saddle points. They're sort of like what happens with a cubic in one variable. This goes down, flattens out momentarily in all directions, and then goes down again. So it's got directions of going down, directions of going up. It's not a saddle point because I don't have one direction where it's a minimum and one direction where it's a maximum. I sort of have instead this behavior of going down, flattening out, and going down again like the cubic. Uh, it might be in fact a maximum in this direction, but since it's not a minimum in the other direction, it's not a saddle point. And again, I have the same behavior here. It goes down, flattens out, then goes down again, and is a maximum in this direction. So I can get these kind of different behaviors at critical points, and indicating that the, the test has to be conclusive at these points, because it can't show a minimum or a maximum or a saddle point, but the point where the test was conclusive, getting my nice maximum, which is the only local or global max or min of this particular function.